Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, and it has been one hell of a weekend. In fact, I have a fairly major confession to make. Um, but it's probably best if I start at the beginning. So, anyway. You've probably heard, certainly if you saw the surprise video that got posted yesterday, that the ring competition for World of Warships has started up again. Now, just in case you're not aware of what this is, uh, this is a contest among the World of Warships community contributors to see which of us, actually, this time around, there are going to be two of us, uh, one for the Russian audience and one for the English-speaking audience. Well, one for the Russian audience and one for everybody else. So, uh, a contest to see who amongst the World of Warships community contributors are going to be included into the game as a unique commander. So, naturally, I need to win this. However, this is where things start to get complicated. Well, not for you. For you, things are actually very simple and straightforward. Um, but for the community contributors, and for me in particular, let me explain. So, the way it works is every week, a code is announced which activates a bonus mission in World of Warships. This week's mission is actually pretty simple. All you have to do is get five Defender Ribbons. You don't have to earn the ribbons in the same battle. You can play as many battles as it takes for you to earn five Defender Ribbons and complete the mission. Oh, apparently you also have to be playing in ships of tier five and above. Now you guys have got until the next mission is announced, so end of the week on Friday, in order to complete this mission. But it's not quite that straightforward for the community contributors. We have to not only get the mission completed, which isn't that difficult, it's only five Defender Ribbons, but we have to not only get the mission completed, we have to do it by Monday at the very latest, because we have to complete the mission and then put together a video proving that we've completed the mission and get that video up by today. Now remember, this mission is only given out on the Friday and we have to complete it, put together a video proving we've completed it and get that video up by the Monday. Which means we, the community contributors, have to complete this mission during the weekend. And you all know what the standard of gameplay is like on the weekend. Uh, frankly, while I love playing World of Warships, I try to avoid playing it on weekends, if at all possible. Unfortunately, now I have to play World of Warships on the weekend, whether I like it or not, in order to actually stand a chance of completing the various different tasks laid out for us by Wargaming in the ring competition. So, shit. <laughs> Now, I can't speak for the other community contributors. I don't know what their weekly schedules are like. But this is particularly troublesome for me, because Saturday is the only day off I get in a week. Um, and Sunday is pretty busy for me as well, because that's when I do this episode of Mingles with Jingles. Now, as it happens, this time around, I actually got very, very lucky. And I completed the mission in the very... Well, not the very first, but in the second random battle that I played in World of Warships on Saturday. So that was it. That was all I had to do. <laughs> Although apparently um, my entry doesn't really count because I completed it in HMS Orion, which is a tier 4 battleship. And technically uh, you have to be playing in tier 5 ships or higher, but I'm sure nobody noticed. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so I actually got off quite lucky this week. I only had to waste well an hour or so of my alleged day off in the week on Saturday playing World of Warships and then another hour and a half, two hours actually editing and processing the video proving that I'd done it. But then Sunday, yesterday, was an incredibly busy day. And this is kind of leading up to the confession that I have to make because today, Monday, I've got a couple of things arriving and I needed to make space for them. And that meant I had to move a lot of stuff around in the man cave. Now, at the back of the man cave there's a cupboard, and the contents of that cupboard haven't seen the light of day in a very, very long time. Um, so, I was up bright and early Sunday morning, clearing out the man cave, and more specifically this cupboard, because I've actually got a gun rack now, uh, for some, most, not all, of my airsoft rifles. Uh, it holds 11. <laughs> um, like I said, it holds most of my airsoft rifles, but definitely not all. Um, and that gun rack was, until yesterday, sitting behind the chair in front of my computer desk. But I kind of had to move it, and the only place where there was any space was inside this old cupboard, so... 
I opened it. <laughs> oh man. Um, apparently the cats have been using this place as a toddler for the last three years. There was some really nasty stuff inside this cupboard. I found my old pair of British Army Pro boots in there. These are very, very good combat boots. Um, they have them in the Navy, but they're so exclusive they only issue them to aircrew. These things are like 120 pounds a pair. Well, they were ruined. I didn't even want to touch them after what the cats had done to them. But I did find a couple of other things in there that I've completely forgotten I owned. Like a deactivated MP40 machine pistol, for example. <laughs> um, and a deactivated M1 rifle. Um, I mean, I knew I had them, but I've kind of forgotten about them completely. They've been in this cupboard for so long. So that was nice. Anyway, I cleared out the contents of this cupboard. Uh, filled multiple bin bags full of rubbish that we had to take down to the dump yesterday as well. Uh, cleared it out, made space, picked up the gun rack, transported it and its contents into the cupboard. All of my old PCs, just taken up space around the man cave, picked them up and moved them into the cupboard as well. Um, which created a hell of a lot of space in the room. Because I needed to put together another storage shelf, which arrived on Friday and was going where the gun rack was behind the chair where my computer desk is. And the reason for that is because I have a big old table with a couple of display shelves on it and I need to take everything that was on that table and move it onto this new storage shelf. The reason I needed to do that was because I need the space on that table because it's going to be the home to a brand new 42 inch monitor and I, I don't really know how to say this. It's best if I just come out and say it. A brand new 42 inch monitor and a PlayStation 4. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm I realise this must come as a massive and crushing disappointment to you all. I am joining the ranks of the console peasants, and I'm doing it for one reason. Well, actually I'm doing it for more than one reason, but um, the main reason is Red Dead Redemption 2. I finished Assassin's Creed Odyssey, actually. I finished it twice. <laughs> The first DLC for it isn't coming out until December. And over the weekend and a couple of days prior to it, I was watching Circumflexes on Twitch streaming Red Dead Redemption 2. And I need this game in my life. I don't know if you've seen anybody playing it, whether that's on Twitch or on YouTube videos, but holy shit, it is absolutely amazing. And of course, it's a console exclusive, isn't it? I raised the idea of getting a PlayStation 4 with Rita. And she said, oh, that's a great idea, but where are you going to put it? There's no space in the man cave. I was like, eh, well, you're right. She said, well, you can put it in here, in my room. I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> she streams 10 to 12 hours a day. When would I ever get the chance to use the thing? She said, oh, no, I'd look after it for you. I'm sure you would. Uh, because she wants to play Red Dead Redemption 2 as badly as I do. I'd never get a chance. So that meant it had to go in the man cave, and that meant I had to spend most of Sunday lifting and shifting, ditching rubbish, moving stuff around, and basically prepping the place ready to accept a big-ass monitor and a PlayStation 4. Now, I'm obviously not just going to be using it for Red Dead Redemption 2. The whole point of getting a, as big a monitor as possible is so I can actually, well, set up a sort of home entertainment system, because you can also use the PlayStation 4 as a Blu-ray player. It's really difficult to get a Blu-ray drive built into a PC these days. I always used to do that, uh, because I've got quite a large Blu-ray collection. Um, before that, I had a large DVD collection. In fact, I still do. I just barely ever watch them anymore. Purely and simply because it's next to impossible when you specify a new PC these days. They'll come with DVD writers, no problem. But you try to get a Blu-ray drive in them, it, just forget it. So I'll be able to actually watch the movies on my Blu-ray collection again. Which is why I wanted the big monitor, because I want to actually use it as a home entertainment system. I mean, I, I have an external Blu-ray drive. They're actually not that expensive, but they're a pain in the arse. Um, so, having the facility to be able to actually curl up with Rita and watch a good movie every now and then, in comfort rather than hunched over a PC monitor, seemed like a bloody good idea. So, most of Sunday, certainly right after getting out of bed, well into the middle of the afternoon was spent lifting, shifting, moving, dumping and assembling various different things in order to clear out the space in the man cave for the new monitor and I'm really sorry about this. 
a PlayStation 4. This is the first time I've ever owned a games console. I've never had a console. I've always had personal computers, so... I'm sure I must be a great disappointment to you all. <laughs> anyway. Right after doing all of that, I went out with my very good friend Eddie to watch the Queen biopic, Bohemian Rhapsody. Holy shit. Wow, that movie was amazing. I'm aware that there are several historical inaccuracies in the movie, but I didn't really care because it's a movie about Queen and Freddie Mercury, and I'm a massive fan of Queen in general, and Freddie Mercury in particular. I appreciate that the movie's probably not going to be that impressive to anybody who isn't um, a fan of the band, but wow. <laughs> when, when I heard that they'd cast Rami Malek as Freddie Mercury, uh, if you don't know who Rami Malek is, he was in, he was in the Pacific, um, and also the Netflix TV show, or is it the Amazon TV show, Mr. Robot with Christian Slater. But he's a skinny streak of piss, <laughs> and he's quite short. Now, Freddie Mercury was quite a big guy, and also pretty tall, but he absolutely nails the performance. It is just amazing how good he is. Funnily enough, one of his co-stars, um, I can't remember the name of the actor, but he plays Queen's bass player, John Deacon, the quiet member of the band. Um, I thought, you know, I've, I've seen him in something before, and I couldn't remember what it was, so as soon as I got home from watching the movie, I went and Googled him. Turns out I have seen him before. He actually starred alongside Rami Malek, who plays Freddie Mercury in the movie, in the HBO miniseries The Pacific. He played Private Eugene Sledge. And then things got even weirder, because it turns out that many, many years before that, he was in the original Jurassic Park movie. Now, you probably wouldn't recognise him, because he played the young boy. <laughs> you know the two annoying kids in Jurassic Park? He was the little boy. So, you know, that kind of blew my mind. Uh, but anyway, a couple of things that I learned from watching the movie. Uh, back when Queen played Rio, which at that time was the biggest concert they had ever played. In fact, it was one of the biggest concerts anybody had ever played. Because it was in Brazil, they had absolutely no idea whether anybody in the audience actually understood a word they were singing. But then it came to the part where they were going to play Love of My Life. And the opening bars of the song played. And then just as Freddie was about to start singing, the audience, all, I don't know, 80,000 of them, started singing the song back to him. And they were completely blown away by it. You can look it up on YouTube, because it's just a, a stunning moment where the entire crowd basically sing this song to the band. Well, anyway... That apparently gave Brian May, the guitarist, a couple of ideas. So when they were in the studio recording their next album, he wanted to write a song that the audience could play with the band, based on their experience at their concert in Brazil. Now, what instruments can the audience play? Well, aside from singing, they can stamp their feet and clap their hands. And that's why they wrote Another One Bites the Dust. I had no idea, and I learned that from watching the movie. Well, anyway, uh, the movie was great. Uh, myself and Eddie absolutely loved it. Um, we may have even shed the occasional manly tear at several points throughout the movie, because we're both massive Queen fans. In fact, I need to check up with my friend Roy, because he's also a huge fan of Queen, to see whether or not he's actually seen this movie yet. And if not, Roy, what are you waiting for? Get your ass into gear and go and watch it. Um, and then I came home and sat down in order to do this episode of Mingles with Jingles. By the time you see this, my PS4 may have even arrived, and I may no longer be a proud card-carrying member of the PC Master Race. I may, in fact, right now, as you're watching this video, actually be a dirty, filthy console peasant. <laughs> and, <laughs> and once again, I do apologise. I must be a massive disappointment to all of you. But I did, I did fairly well. This is the first time I've ever owned a games console. I've managed 48 years without one. That's pretty good. Most of you probably can't say that. And hey, look on the bright side. I'll be able to get into the beta test of World of Warships Legends now. <laughs> I'm already on their Discord, uh, and I've been following development, but now I'll actually be able to play it as well. So hooray. You know, it's, it's, you've got to look on the bright side where this sort of thing is concerned. 
Hey, I just had another thought. Now that I'm officially a dirty, filthy console scrub, I might actually be able to play a chieftain in World of Tanks as well. <laughs> you see, there are upsides to this sort of thing. Right, anyway, moving along swiftly. There were a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. Uh, one of which is to do with the demise of Fractured Space. Well, the game's not dead, but the, they have... Edge Case Games have just announced that following the next patch, with the infestation update, they will be ceasing development of Fractured Space. They're going to leave the servers switched on, so you'll be able to continue playing. Um, but future development, as of, well, the next patch, is no more. Uh, they're moving on to bigger and better things, hopefully, so that's a bit of a shame. It's just a shame that we live in a world where you don't have to produce a good game in order to be successful. All you have to do is have a massive marketing budget. Call of Duty World War II. Oh my god, what a turd of a game. Star Wars Battlefront 2. Not even as good as that. And yet both sell hundreds of millions of copies. Edge Case Games. Zero marketing budget. And they have a couple of good games to their name. They were the developers of Strike Suit Zero. Does anybody remember that? That did quite well. And the success of that game funded the development of Fractured Space. Unfortunately, they had zero marketing budget. In fact, they were almost completely reliant on, well, people like me putting videos up on YouTube and people live streaming the game in order to get word of mouth around. But it just wasn't enough. Just making a good game and hoping people notice it just isn't enough these days. I mean, I realise that opinions on computer games are always going to be subjective. And yet, I would assert with some confidence that there are any number of games out there from small independent developers self-published on Steam, like Fractured Space, but there are many others that you could point to as examples, that are far superior to AAA big budget piles of shit like Call of Duty World War II and Star Wars Battlefront II, and yet they sell hundreds of millions of copies. And how many people have heard of Fractured Space? How many people have heard of Inside? How many people have heard of What Remains of Edith Finch? And these are all fantastic games. But nobody's playing them. Zero marketing budget. The almighty dollar rules everything. That, unfortunately, is the world that we live in. Still, fingers crossed for Edge Case Games, and I wish them the best of luck with their future projects. All of which brings us on to the final issue that I wanted to talk about in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. And that's to do with the question of ethics, not just in video games, but, well, in life in general. My latest Assassin's Creed Odyssey video, which hardly any of you watched. <laughs> Whatever, don't care. Um, raised a couple of interesting questions to do with um, morality, ethics and choices. The video featured our hero Cassandra. Um, yes, I know technically she's not a hero, she's a heroine. But if you say heroine on YouTube, <laughs> oh shit and I just did. Uh, I have very little doubt that YouTube's algorithms are going to think I'm talking about drugs. Uh, but anyway, whatever, I don't monetize these uh, Mingles with Jingles videos anyway. Thanks once again, by the way, to everybody who supports me on Patreon. You're responsible for that. Um, but our hero, got to be careful to try to stay out of trouble uh, with the YouTube bots. Our hero, Cassandra, wandering around ancient Greece, uh, casually murdering left, right and centre, and being followed around by the Athenian philosopher Socrates, who continually put it to the question regarding the moral choices that she was making. Now, the one mission in particular that seemed to gather some attention regarded a horse thief. For those of you who haven't seen the video, this guy stole a horse. Stole a horse from a rich man who had a lot of horses. He could certainly spare the horse. He didn't steal his best horse, and he needed the horse because his horse had died, and he needed it to help him run the farm so he could feed his starving family, and so on and so on. The game asked you the question, what should happen to him? He's been caught. He's guilty of horse theft. Should he be punished? Or should he be excused because he really needed the horse? Now, I am of the opinion, and I always have been, and this is not the first time you've heard me say this, I am of the opinion that you should always be prepared to face the consequences of your actions. Now, the consequences of stealing a horse and getting caught can be fairly severe. Should the guy be let off? I made the case 
that the fact that he didn't steal the best horse, he really needed the horse, and the guy that he stole it from probably didn't even notice it was missing. I made the case that these are not excuses, these are mitigating factors. These are the sort of things that would be taken into account by a judge when deciding on what kind of sentence to hand down. What kind of sentence would you give to a man who is as guilty as sin when it comes to the charge of horse theft? He's not trying to say he didn't do it, he admits he did it, he's been caught red-handed. The question of guilt is not at issue here. Now a couple of people tried to say, well, horse theft isn't that bad, is it? Well, depends on the circumstances. I mean, under these circumstances, the guy he stole the horse from probably isn't even aware that he was missing a horse. So, under these circumstances, yeah. It's not actually that much of a crime. Nobody's really been hurt by this. It's just property theft. However, if you're in the desert of the Sierra Nevada in 1879 and somebody steals your horse, they've basically killed you. You could die in the length of time it would take you to reach the next outpost of civilization if somebody's stolen your horse. So the circumstances are definitely important. People then went on to say, well, what if it was more serious? What about murder? Because Jingles, you seem to be getting awfully judgy for somebody who's running around ancient Greece murdering every second person they meet. You don't exactly occupy the moral high ground here. But I'd argue that I do, because I'm not trying to justify any of my murders. <laughs> not while playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey either. I'm not trying to claim I'm special, and I shouldn't face the consequences of the multiple homicides that I commit every time I log in to play Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The thing is, the consequences in that game are that you get a bounty placed on your head, and bounty hunters have to come after you. And I don't try to explain to the bounty hunters that the people that I killed needed killing. I just stab them. <laughs> Until they stop trying to capture me. Because, you see, this whole accepting the consequences of your actions thing kind of works both ways. And if you're coming after me in an attempt to claim the bounty on my head, the consequences of that are that you're very likely to get stabbed as well. Because <laughs> I ain't going down without a fight. Um, so, as you can see, I'm definitely not being hypocritical. <laughs> uh, and on that bombshell... That's pretty much it for this week's episode of Ningles with Jingles. By the time you see this, I'll probably be murdering lots of people in Red Dead Redemption 2. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and good luck with any members of the Pinkerton Detective Agency who want to try and come and take me in in that game as well. Anyway, that is it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've all had a great weekend. And of course, as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.